Okay. All right. Let's get started. We'll need to, you guys in the back to quiet down sure. so that we can uh, have and, and give the attention to our speakers here. So up next, we have Randy and Brandon, who's going to talk about being dangerous to threat actors with Legos. With that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Hi, I'm Brandon Levine. I work for Google, Chronicle, GCP, whatever the hell you want to call it these days. I'm Randy Pargman. I work for Binary Defense and uh, work on the threat hunting and counterintelligence teams. And uh, we were told not to bother with like introduction and who on my slides, so we're just going to dive right into this. All right. So I do want to give a little bit of introduction. Yep. Um, before I worked at Binary Defense, I worked uh, 15 years for the FBI um, in uh, cybercrime investigations as a computer scientist. And I want to make it really clear that I am speaking um, in my role as a binary defense employee. I am not representing the government, not representing law enforcement um, in this talk. Um, the reason that uh, we wanted to give this presentation is because we both have noticed that there are some really uh, good ways that security companies and researchers can work with law enforcement in a positive way um, to affect um, uh, criminal justice and uh, positive outcomes for the criminals um, to go through the criminal justice system. And then there's a lot of people who just don't know how to do it. So that's Me. why we wanted to address this. Uh, yeah, in my perspective, I'll be speaking from the private industry perspective, uh, my own experience through, through the years as a peer researcher. I've never been law enforcement, so having uh, Randy here is, is, is incredible because this will be a really great way for us to foil things. So. Without further ado. All right. So this is kind of the ideal state of the way that we think most people would like the world to work around cybercrime. Um, that security researchers and defenders, as they detect malicious activity, would be able to find the, um, the uh, infrastructure associated with the threat actors and be able to provide that easily to law enforcement. Just like if your business was robbed in the middle of the night, you come to work and you find that there's been a break-in, you should be able to pick up the phone, call the police, the police come out, they know how to investigate, they look for fingerprints, you provide them the information that they need, and then the police are able to pursue that investigation and bring someone to justice, right? That's kind of the way that we wish it worked in cybercrime. Um, in the actual world, though, uh, we know that it doesn't. So how it really works in the real world, uh, I mean, the divide, the divide between InfoSec and law enforcement stems from misaligned objectives. And uh, in the meantime, criminals continue to make money hand over fist with zero repercussions. So the question that we need to ask when there's a disconnect between the ideal state, how we'd like it to work, and the actual state of the world as we see it is why. Um, we'd love for this to be a discussion as we uh, uh, have time for questions at the end. Um, if you have some more ideas about why this is or how we can address this, we'd love to see it. But as we were thinking about this problem, we really came up with um, these, these ideas for the reasons why. We're just gonna alternate on the bullet points. Yep. So uh, the first one is that Victims really don't want to be identified, right? There is an obvious um, negative repercussion for brand image and trust when companies are identified as being the victim of a cybercrime. If no one knows, then maybe there won't be any repercussions. And so um, a lot of attorneys, especially as they're advising their clients, will say, you know, there's, there's no upside to this, we should just not notify law enforcement because we don't want this to ever become public. And for most private sector, police or law enforcement in general seem relatively un, uh, unapproachable. You know, uh, how many people in this room have tried to share data with law enforcement or have shared data with law enforcement? Okay, keep your hand up if you've ever gotten anything back. Okay, one person out of the 10 that, that did that. Not very good uh, odds of actually getting anything back. And th this leads to sort of a this sense of lack of transparency, uh, transparency around the uh, communication channels. And 
to be frank, law enforcement is complicated to an outsider. The objectives are, mis are, are not necessarily aligned with private, with private interests. Um, and the, uh, it, it, going to the police or the FBI as, as you're a victim of a cyber intrusion is seen as sort of a desperation play. Oh, I need to bring the FBI in, in on this. That's a huge step to take for an organization. It doesn't really happen very often. Um, the next reason is a lack of trust. Um, I think this really stems from a misunderstanding or misalignment of objectives, but there's mistrust on both sides. Um, this can be overcome, and this is one of the positive messages, I think, of uh, this presentation and our discussion around it, but as it stands right now, if you don't know anyone in law enforcement and you are uh, in the private sector, you might not have any idea what they're going to do with information that you share with them. If there's the perception that law enforcement n might not have the same objectives in mind and uh, they might take the information that you give them and make it public, do some kind of uh, a PR thing that says, uh, you know, we're, we're investigating this crime and this company was the victim, um, that, that leads to a lack of trust, not, not having that clear understanding of roles and what everybody's going to do. But on the other side, there's also a lack of trust too, especially working with security researchers. Law enforcement might think because of some incidents in the past that if they share some information with a security researcher, they're immediately going to publish it on a blog and give all the details away. Or Twitter, which is the number one source for threat intelligence, as we all know. Absolutely. And as you know, as, as researchers, as defenders, when someone publishes something to uh, too wide of an audience, broader than the distribution that you had placed on the restrictions for that information, that can be very damaging, right? So law enforcement also is concerned that if they provide information back to a security researcher and that security researcher does not respect the uh, limitations placed on sharing of that information, that it's going to burn the case. So enterprise defenders and law enforcement personnel fall under really different rules. They have very different obligations, different regulations. And this leads to a sort of a, a clash of cultures. You can always, if you've ever been to DEF CON, the whole spot, spot the Fed, it's pretty easy. You can generally tell by their bearing, generally tell by the dress and the style. And that culture, that clash of cultures has led to traditionally a fair amount of friction in our, in our interactions. It doesn't actually have to be that way, though. It's sort of this subjective opinion that law enforcement, from a private perspective, is going to be the sort of, you know, suit and tie, cagey, cagey sort, um, and that's not necessarily how it has to be. And, and we are moving in a direction where that's not that ha is no longer the case. Another reason why this happens is a lack of results or the impression on the part of the victims and the defenders that they're there's very few results that law enforcement gets. Part of this is a lack of publication of the results or a lap, lack of publicity. Quite often a big uh, criminal spree or a big, uh, big break-in will get a lot more attention than the apprehension of the threat actors maybe a couple of years later. This is something that we can also overcome and it is a self-fulfilling prophecy if you believe it. If you say, well, the police aren't going to catch them anyway, and so I might as well not share, well, then you're pretty much guaranteeing that the police aren't going to catch them because they've got nothing to work with. It's, it's exactly the same as not reporting uh, a physical crime. The police are not going to be able to get results. However, there have been some really fantastic results of criminals brought to justice. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple of those, but uh, pay attention to those when they hit the news and spread the word on Twitter. Yes. Go Twitter. <laughs> Non-lawyer spokesperson. So this is a bit of our agenda slide. Uh, we're going to actually, now that we've sort of had uh, established a backstory to all of our, all of, a, of why we're approaching this issue, um, we're going to sort of represent a framework or a thought pa pattern to, uh, for a better approach to this. Um, so I'm not going to go deeply into this uh, because each and every part of our of the of the remainder of the presentation will go into this quite deeply. So first of all, we're going to talk about a general approach, um, and the approach that we are recommending is instead of trying to report individual occurrences of a cybercrime, like there was this one incident and there was a break-in, 
trying to report that as a one-off sort of thing. Instead, it is really useful if researchers come together, defenders come together, and figure out amongst ourselves what are the really big um, threats so that we can concentrate on those and get some really big wins. So for investigators, diversity of visibility is critical to the success of an investigative effort. No one individual or organization has a complete view into a campaign or an intrusion. This has come up time and time again. You see this when you see all these different names for groups. It's important to have those types of different names because they are uh, also subjective uh, as far as perspective goes. We need to, f uh, to collaborate to fill in the gaps and develop cohesive, meaningful narratives. Uh, defenders are the front line, the IR guys, the SOC guys. This is the ground level visibility. Some of the guys that, Randy, that are under Randy, uh, they are the best equipped to understand the everyday impact of a cyber crime. And this really helps for uh, determining prioritization and where effort can actually be expended uh, as far as uh, efficiency. And researchers like myself, like many others, um, can also help place defender level visibility in the context. If one organization is seeing a ton of trick bot, um, what are other researchers seeing? Are we seeing it distributed across the United States? Are we seeing it distributed uh, in geospecific regions? So think of that as like the sky level view. And finally, you really need someone within these groups that has the experience or the capability uh, to coordinate with law enforcement uh, frequently. Um, it's sort of like a translation layer. Uh, think about an office space. I take the specs from the, from the uh, customer and send them to the engineer. That guy probably wasn't really good at his job, but you know, theoretically, this sort of translation layer is really important. So how do we collectively identify uh, actors' behaviors that can lead us to the big wins? Uh, we really need to focus on the scope and scale which then needs to be translated into focus within working groups. Uh, how many of you have been a part of a working group or uh, part of like a listserv for like InfoSec? You may have noticed a sort of um, dilution of those sort of communities in the, in the recent last five years. And with, along with that dilution, we had this lack of focus. So one of, the really one of the biggest things I want to take away from this is that type of effort really needs to be kicked in the butt. Um, the focus needs to be brought back, the specialization needs to, be, needs to be brought back, and we need to really hone in on these specific sets of threats. So we need to identify the threat activity that is widespread and constant with big impact. Think Emotet, think, think Gozy v3, think back in the day Game Over Zeus, think some of the big game ransomware hunters. All of those guys are great targets. We need to find the patterns in the malware, and this is where the technical expertise of the private community really comes in. Uh, Randy, how many like how many people would you estimate at the FBI have like researcher level knowledge of malware? Um, very few, very yeah. few. Meanwhile, probably eclipsed by the number of people at any three major companies that have intelligence teams, and we need to leverage that to our advantage. We can actually short shortcut a lot of the work that law enforcement has to do as part of our normal jobs. So finding patterns in malware, infrastructure, SSL certificates, domain names, uh, many other patterns that you may consider IOCs. I'm a proponent of behavioral identification. And you really need to form these focus groups dedicated to stopping threats. Um, another point I want to make about the focus groups is it's really important to form a focus group around a specific threat, not just a focus group that uh, broadly looks at lots of threats. Um, it's important to start there, but then once you've identified what is that big win, what is, what is the major cybercrime group that your group wants to go after and make an impact on, form a group just around that threat. If you keep that focused, then you're able to um, uh, provide the best value, really, and you know who in that group is providing the, the best information. You can share amongst yourselves, and you can share directly with law enforcement that way. So next I want to talk about some really practical ways that um, as a researcher or a defender you can anonymize um, the uh, victims, the companies that are affected by the cybercrime to get around that problem and that objection. So first of all we want to talk about the competing objectives. These are the things that uh, cause tension as, uh, as researchers are trying to share with law enforcement. And these are the things that we want to get around with a better strategy. So first of all, the police need to know some things about the victim and the damage so that they can appropriately scope 
the investigation. First of all, they need to know um, where is this crime located? Because uh, crimes are prosecuted by geographic districts in different um, uh, areas of the country, there's a different court that is responsible for that crime or the prosecution of that crime. And so it's important for law enforcement to know where it's at. That's where the police usually want to know who's the victim, where, where are these victims. That's also something that we can overcome by concentrating on the widespread crimes, the things that are affecting the whole of the United States or Western Europe or all over the world even. If we concentrate on those type of crimes, then it becomes less important to identify this particular incident happened here because you know that eventually that area is going to be one of the ones that is affected. I think this is uh, one of the biggest disconnects that we as, pri as private practitioners have with law enforcement. We sort of assume that giving over some IOCs or some malware or samples like that are, is enough evidence for law enforcement to uh, pursue a case. And that's not actually the case. Without a crime, the police can't do anything. Um, and this is, uh, I mean, we're dramatically underreporting incidents. Um, and without reporting, enforcement is a complete non starter. Yep. The police also need to know about the seriousness of the crime so that they can assign the the correct resources to it. If it's a very minor crime that really didn't cost that much to the victims, then it's probably not worth the limited resources of law enforcement being spent on that when they could be spent on fighting a really large organized cybercrime group instead. So on the other side of this coin. Uh, on the other side of this coin, victim companies don't want to be identified because they fear damage to reputation, loss of value, angry shareholders. We've all seen the impacts of breaches on stocks. Uh, we've seen the CISO, we've seen many CISO heads roll. Um, it's become sort of a meme at this point where you join as a CISO expecting to be breached and you get a sweet golden parachute. You know, that damage to the, rep to the company's reputation could lead to legal repercussions. Think Equifax. Uh, that had massive legal repercussions. Probably not enough. You know, tomato, tomato. But uh, victims are, a victim organization or private companies have this massive ingrained fear or their lawyers are just going to tell them, don't talk to law enforcement, don't make us liable, don't put us in the firing line. And unfortunately, this is a detriment to actually preventing and fighting these types of, this type of crime. Uh, because without any reporting, there's no evidence of the crime, there's no case. All right, so now I want to give you a really practical example of how this has worked really well. This is a repeatable pattern, and this is something that, um, as I am now in the private industry, I have applied the same pattern and uh, used this to be able to report information to law enforcement in an appropriate way, too. So the um, incident response company um, in this case, and I'm just going to uh, say as an aside, um, I think that trust is very important. Um, you need to maintain trust by not revealing information that people uh, don't want you to reveal. And so as I give these patterns, I'm not going to say exactly which company it was. In, and I hope that you will understand the reason for that. So in this case, the incident response company noticed a pattern. It was a widespread and very destructive cybercrime group that was really targeting a lot of different companies across the board. None of the companies wanted to report to law enforcement, and I don't blame them. They didn't want their Shocking. names to be the first associated with this giant crime spree. However, the incident response company um, was concerned enough about it to share information kind of on, uh, on a broad level. Law enforcement needed to get something. They needed to have like you know a piece of the malware as evidence, something to say, you know, this is, uh, this is a piece of evidence that provides us probable cause to go after the command and control server. So in this case, the incident response company was able to ask their clients if they could share a piece of malware that did not identify the company. They'd already analyzed the malware, and you know how sometimes there's victim information built into malware, so you want to be careful with that. But they had already analyzed it. They knew that the victim was not going to be identified, and with their client's permission, they shared a sample of the malware with law enforcement. That was enough to have that report from the um, incident response company that this is a widespread problem, people are trying to get into companies all over the US, here's a sample of the malware that is shared from one of the companies, they don't need to be identified, law enforcement was able to take that 
and without having to know what the company was at all, they were still able to use that as probable cause to go after the command and control server and start making progress on this case. That, that's a really useful pattern, and I have used that um, in my work as well, as we have uh, investigated um, uh, malware that we're uh, looking at to figure out uh, what are the patterns that we can use to protect our clients. We're also finding things like the command and control server, and sometimes we see a pattern in it. As we analyze multiple samples from the same threat group, we see a pattern in the infrastructure. That's something that we also are able to report to law enforcement without giving up any information about uh, who's victimized. So one of the things that we wanted to uh, really bring to people's attention is the importance of a shared chat channel, uh, trans clear, transparent communication. Keeping a group small, focused, and trusted, um, vetted in some way, there's no met trust, there's I would drink a beer with this person, even if they don't drink a beer, uh, those types of things are incredibly important. With the increase in number of people that are in the industry and the increase in uh, just geo-distribution of people, that's not always possible. So you do need to be careful on who and uh, who you involve how you, and how you involve them. It is perfectly okay to have a very large group of individuals talking generally about InfoSec. It's not okay to have that exact same group try to fo focus everything on TrickBot. It's not going to work. You need to have a small, focused, trusted group that can rapidly iterate on research and create these sort of information boluses or packages for law enforcement and that, that understand how to translate that. I mean, set clear rules and expectations for handling. This information is TLP red. This information is TLP amber. That's uh, very important. T uh, TLP traffic light protocol is probably the most well understood and most used. Unfortunately, as a previous speaker mentioned, there really is no, you know, if you break TLP, you're just a dick. That's about it. Um, so you do need to understand who you're working with. Uh, emails, email list servers have been obviously really popular. Uh, there's a lack of uh, real-time sort of interaction there, so things like Slack or Mattermost or Keybase are becoming much more popular, especially for to have uh, to facilitate the next point, which is a way to talk off lists directly, so direct engagement between things. So researchers can talk about things without necessarily revealing things, without revealing uh, additional details. Um, this, you know, accessibility to researchers creates a shared knowledge pool. So one of the organizations that I wanted to point out to you um, is the NCFTA. How many in this room have heard of NCFTA before? All right, just a few. So I'm really glad that I brought this up. National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance, uh, kind of a strange name, but a really great organization. They bring together private industry <clears throat> and law enforcement. There are people who work in the same building together and are able to share information under the NDAs that they have in place. So they can trust that the information is actually protected, um, it's going to be used appropriately, and it's a really great clearinghouse for getting together people who have the information with law enforcement who can use that information, and also the other way around. There's a lot of sharing that goes back from law enforcement um, through NCFDA to private industry as well. Um, now, I also want to be clear that I asked NCFTA um, for permission to talk about this, um, so I'm not revealing anything and I'm not going to um, not gonna get into the details of exactly uh, what they do um, or, or particular cases that they've, that they've facilitated, but I want to give you an example of something that worked really well. So NCFTA hosted um, an in-person meeting. This is something that they do quite frequently. Um, to bring together researchers who knew about a particular cybercrime threat with law enforcement. In that meeting, people were able to develop some trust. Just meeting someone face-to-face -face at a conference like this, getting to know them um, over a meal, getting to uh, uh, know that you can trust that they're going to do what they say they're going to do with the information, that's really, really valuable to building a team. Um, having that as the kickoff to uh, a trust sharing group was fantastic. Everybody got together in person, they were able to present uh, what they knew about the threat, everyone was open with sharing information, and then NCFDA hosted a listserv to keep the communication going. That was also really valuable because all of the different researchers were able to share information that they had about this threat on, a, on an ongoing basis. This is something that 
um, can be repeated over and over. If you have a serious cybercrime group that you are hunting, chances are there's new intel every single day, right? There's some new infrastructure springing up, there's some new uh, phishing campaign, there's something that can be shared. Sharing that directly from researchers to other researchers and defenders was super valuable. I think that was probably the biggest bang for the buck. But having law enforcement as part of that loop as well meant that as that information was being discovered in real time, as the phishing campaign was just getting started, law enforcement is already able to go after the infrastructure of the threat actors. Um, so preserving evidence is really important. Um, this is something that uh, we want to talk about because quite often as a researcher, you're not really concerned about preserving evidence. You're just concerned about getting the information out as quickly as you can. So when you're thinking about evidence and things that you, that you would preserve, think logs, think memory dumps, think malware samples, PCAPs, NetFlow data. All of these things are critically important. Um, you need to be able to answer where did this come from, why did I collect it, um, and what does it mean? There's generally a fear that law enforcement will come in to seize like a compromised workstation or server or victim at a victim company. And using good digital forensic practices um, in your regular work uh, and keeping good records, like actually having good notes, means that law enforcement can use the evidence collected by a researcher or by incident responders without having to further interrupt the business by taking computers as evidence. That's something most companies want to avoid. If you do a good job in actually taking notes, you can actually be really productive. So types of things that you need to know. Time of observation. Time is critically important. Uh, I'm assuming that most people in here have tried to use an IP address as an IOC. That sucks. Uh, the temporality of, of such a, an IOC is suspect at best and dubious at worst. Uh, Consider the target type. Is this hitting a DC? Is this hitting, is this hitting uh, the, the uh, director of finance? Is this hitting his ABP? Consider the actions that are observed. Was malware dropped? Was something, uh, was something downloaded with PowerShell? Was something then executed directly into memory and, things, and uh, the executables deleted off disk? These are all things that need to be understood. And then preserve the artifacts. Preserve that memory. Preserve the process dump. Preserve the, the, the disk image if that's the type of forensics you still do. I want to give another example um, from my work at Binary Defense. Um, and this is going beyond preserving the evidence that you have on hand um, at the victim side and actually making an effort to preserve the evidence on the command and control servers themselves. So um, this, is, this was really an experiment to see um, if this would work. But in a particular investigation, as uh, we were looking at an ongoing intrusion, we saw the attacker's infrastructure, we knew what IP address it was at, and it was hosted in the United States. It was physically in the US. This wasn't something because of the time and um, the, the uh, situation that we could tell law enforcement about right away, but we were able to contact the hosting provider for that command and control server and say, hey, listen, we're a private company, but we know that there's an attack going on from this IP address right now. We knew that this was part of a larger investigation of a serious cybercrime group that we knew was being investigated. This was not just a one-off sort of thing. We knew that law enforcement would be interested in this and that this would be useful evidence. We didn't want, as we were mitigating the threat, for the threat actors to realize that, that the game was up, roll up all their infrastructure, delete all the files, and be out of there, not, not leaving behind anything for law enforcement to find. And so we asked the hosting provider, can you make a copy of this? Don't give us anything, but can you preserve this server as it is right now? And we're going to notify law enforcement, and then they are going to contact you with the appropriate legal process. Does that make sense? So I didn't know if that would work. This is also really recent, if I, if I know which, if I, th I think I know which one you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So um, it actually worked. Um, the hosting provider um, wrote right back and said, we just want to say that we're not under any obligation to do this for you because you're not uh, a government agency. However, we understand this is a threat and we're happy to do it. We'll, we'll make a copy of it. Um, as it turns out, nothing is as simple as you would like it to be. So that physical hosting provider, it was a colo location or a, a, a hosting provider that uh, 
their customer was a virtual private server provider. And that VPS provider was in yet another country, of course, making it more complicated, but it still worked out. The physical hosting provider had direct communication with the VPS hosting provider. The VPS hosting provider had the ability to make a copy of it. And we were able to get information to law enforcement and say, oh, by the way, um, this is in the United States and the hosting provider has already agreed to, to preserve a copy of all the evidence. All you need to do is contact them. Here is the right email address. They're already primed and ready to go. That made it a whole lot easier for law enforcement to take action on this because they weren't um, behind the power curve. They weren't trying to um, go after something that the bad guys had already tried to delete. And that type of facilitation is, is of paramount importance. I mean, that action was taken without any expectation of actually getting the image. All you're doing is teeing up law enforcement to actually help handle that crime. And that is unusual for us to think about because we're all, 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 most of us are really data hungry. We really want to get more. We want to get more context on that. But understand that there is, there is a limitation to your reach as a, private, as a private company. But teeing it up so that law enforcement can carry on on that track is very important. So the, our final point is really on understanding and, and respect uh, between private industry and law enforcement. Um, defenders, our processes are very different as defenders and, and researchers. We have to preserve employer and client privacy is, is incredibly important for various reasons, including liability. We may need to publish. Some of us uh, have like blog quotas, it happens. Um, and we really just don't want to be attributed. We, I, don't, I certainly don't want to be named in any legal case ever. I don't want to testify ever. Um, so these are things that are, are priority to me as, as a private individual or, or as a private firm versus law enforcement. So uh, law enforcement has um, goals and objectives that can be complementary to the defenders. Um, like Brandon mentioned, um, sometimes as a researcher, you need to publish something to a blog. I have seen many uh, cases, in fact, uh, I recently had something that we were going to have to publish to a blog. What we did was we first got the draft together. And as you know, it takes a little while to go through multiple iterations and make sure that it's all polished. While you're in that process, as soon as you've got even the outline of it put together, you can share at that point with law enforcement. That's exactly what we did. We took the information that was going to become public and we shared it with law enforcement first in draft form. And we told them, hey, listen, we're going to have to publish, publish this. This is important for the world to know. This is something that, that we feel is appropriate to share, but we're going to give you a head start on it. Because of that, law enforcement was able to accomplish their goal of preservation. Preservation just means getting a copy of the evidence before the bad guys delete it. And if you publish something on the internet or tweet about it, it's burned. The bad guys know. I mean, they know that everybody else knows, and they're going to start rolling up that infrastructure. It's a very rare case that they don't. So if you can give law enforcement a head start, even just a couple of days, if that's all you've got, that's enough. They can get out a preservation request, and then the, uh, the hosting provider can make a copy of it before the threat actors even know that they've been burned. And then by the time your blog comes out, there's already a copy of that evidence that's been preserved. I also want to talk about probable cause, reasonable suspicion. These are different legal terms that are standards of proof that law enforcement has to show to a competent court in order to get the right order to get the information that they need. So law enforcement can't just go out and ask uh, a hosting provider, hey, give me a copy of that server. They actually need to go to a court and request a search warrant if they're going to get like a copy of the disk of a virtual machine. And that's for a very good reason. In the United States and in a lot of other countries, we want to make sure that privacy is respected, right? And so there has to be probable cause. That just means that there is a reasonable belief that there is evidence of a crime or the fruits or the instrumentalities of the crime that will be found on that server and that a crime has actually been committed. So if you're able as a defender or a researcher to communicate that, that's what Brandon was saying before, what happened? Tell the story um, to the extent that you can so that as law enforcement is putting together their affidavit to the court, they've got something to work with. They've got some facts. They can say, at this particular time, we know that this malware was actively calling out to this command and control server. We know the command and control server was active at this date and time, down to the second. That gives them the ability to action on that IP address and know for sure that it is the right ones. They're not taking the next 
server of the, the next customer who happened to get that IP address instead. And so we're going to move to an interesting case study where actually uh, the speaker and author of this was just speaking yesterday as I believe it was the first talk on the operations track. So if you guys saw this, uh, you may be somewhat familiar with Paul Burbage's work on Malbeacon. Um, but there are some interesting things to consider about uh, this particular project. Um, I'm just going to take this one of those. Yeah, cool. Um, so Malbeacon provides us this opportunity for discovering large botnets. And I'm not going to go into the mechanisms that are used here. Um, I believe most of that work is public. And if you want to know, you can always talk to Paul. Um, but it's interesting here that you are looking at both um, malicious traffic in situ um, and actually getting uh, attacker IPs uh, from, the, from the C2, from poisoning the C2. And this is sort of the critical data that law enforcement can identify and notify victims from. But you need to be able to, to justify this is why I'm sharing this with you. This is what this means. This is the interpretation of this data. Here's where it's sourced from. Here's the specific PCAPs. Here's the specific. You have a burden of, pr uh, law enforcement has a burden of uh, evidence or a burden of proof that must be met versus us in the private industry, I can attribute this to Ryuk, to Emotet, to Gozi without really any repercussions. Uh, usually I try to be right, but not all of us are, not all, and I'm not all right all the time. Uh, law enforcement can't. They, that's not something that's possible for them. They cannot be wrong. They have to prove this in a court of law. So we'll have one uh, less last case study, and this one is uh, really recent within the last uh, 30 days. Um, and this is really probably one of the most impressive um, multinational cybercrime cases that's, I mean, to, to date. We really wanted to highlight this because this is one of the many big wins that comes about through researchers sharing information with law enforcement and multiple countries' law enforcement working together. That's really in cybercrime where we need to make the biggest advances. And this is a wonderful example of a huge advance being made. So in this particular case, there's multiple defendants, uh, two of them who are citizens of the country of Georgia, not the state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia, um, were arrested in Georgia and they were actually prosecuted in the courts in Georgia. This is huge because, as you know, most people cannot be extradited from the country where they are a citizen to another country to face trial. I mean, uh, the United States would not extradite a United States citizen to another country to face a trial uh, based on crimes in that country. Just in the same way, the country of Georgia is not going to extradite its citizens to the United States to go to court here. And that's usually where we stop. As, as defenders, as law enforcement, people just kind of throw up their hands and say, well, what are you going to do? Well, they're in Georgia. Can't touch them. Yeah. And then sometimes you just have to wait and see if maybe they take a vacation in some other uh, country where they could be extradited. But that's, that's really up to the threat actors. If they don't want to leave a country where they're safe, then they're just going to continue doing their crimes. This is a landmark case because the country of Georgia was able to prosecute these people for crimes they committed in the United States. They actually, in the uh, DOJ press release, it uh, indicated that a uh, FBI agent and a computer scientist testified to the crimes that were committed in the United States for the trial in Georgia. These two people who were on trial in Georgia were found guilty and they were sentenced and they're going to be in prison for a long time in their own country, which is entirely appropriate for the crimes that they were committing. Um, there was another defendant that was extradited to the United States uh, from another country, and he stood uh, trial in the U.S. and was also convicted. I mean, this really reinforces the, the sort of convergence of power, um, of multinational power uh, of law enforcement. And this, we need to keep going in this direction to affect change, with, especially in the realm of cybercrime. I mean, we can work together. Uh, criminals will hate it when we start to. Um, there's no time like the present. Um, I have uh, published research in the past on the effectiveness of botnet takedowns. Uh, one of the biggest problems that I found with the 16 takedowns that I observed over the last six, uh, six years is the general cadence of law enforcement um, allows this window of opportunity for recovery. So we need to shorten this kill chain. We need to be able to compress the amount of time it takes for, uh, for us to action 
uh, cybercrime cases and cybercrime um, this affliction. So thank you. Uh, we probably ran a little over time, Sunil. Sorry. Um, we're happy to start a conversation. My contact information is below. Randy's is on top. Thank you very much. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Oh, no. He's the lawyer. I'm terrified of this. <laughs> Thanks, guys. This is a great talk. The biggest concern that I see is issues related to privilege, right? So after a breach, the companies are really hesitant to create this discovery trail in discussions with the FBI because that can all become public. And all you have to have is one FBI analyst who says, wow, these guys are really stupid. I can't believe they let this happen. And then that email becomes public. So how, how do you think through those issues and how would you address that? Yeah, I think that is a very real issue. And um, it's, it's something that has been borne out um, by actual um, occurrences in the past, right? So it's not an unreasonable thing to be worried about. Um, it is important to know that as, uh, as law enforcement investigates a case, um, any email that they um, uh, send or receive having to do with that particular case can be discoverable um, if the defendant goes to trial. Now, in actual practice, most defendants in cybercrime cases do not go to trial. Almost all of them will plead because the case against them is very strong. Um, but the defense attorney for that defendant has the right to discovery and can receive a copy of all of the emails. So I think one of the really important things to set the ground rules properly is as a company is interacting with law enforcement at the very beginning, address these concerns. Say, look, this is something that is going to prevent us from working with you if there's going to be you know, some discovery of some information that we really don't want to be shared with the defense. We really would like to limit what we're sharing with you in a rational way so that you have what you need to work with, but you don't have all of the details. And this, I've seen it work in actual practice where that, that setting the expectations right up front has worked extremely well. I mean, think of it as like a sysadmin when you're admitting a box. You want to share the least, least amount, you, need, you want to share the least amount of information possible for the most impact. So you have to understand that this privileged information is, is obviously uh, potentially detrimental, but you need to, I mean, it's, I hate to say it's basically a risk, assess a risk assessment, but it kind of is where you have this expectation of, all right, what's the minimum amount I can, I can share and still give them enough of a lead or enough of a pivot for this to jump forward? Um, and I think mitigating that uh, when you're when you are thinking about the communications, that has to be part of the consideration. I just don't think anybody. I think people more shoot from the hip on this stuff rather than actually taking cons a considered approach to the way that they communicate, um, and then you get into this sort of hot water situation. Okay. Any other questions? So one quick comment is that last year, um, Aaron Schellmeyer gave a briefing on what effectively, what, what's the most effective thing as it relates to uh, botnet takedowns. And he looked at all these different methods that we use to do takedowns, but, or rather, what, what actions we took. And the one action that made any difference at all was arrests. 100% true. So. Um, I can, the takedown of Game Over Zeus may or may not have led to the rise of, of ransomware because of the gap in monetization. So like, there are considerations um, that, that pure technical action is not effective. Um, and that has borne out in the last six years. Uh, in the last six years in each quarter where a takedown event has happened, within the 90% of cases, um, the, the, it's been, there's been a recovery. Not necessarily the same malware, but there's been a gap that gets filled so you see the same sort of volume of activity within the next three months. And that's a very short period of time. So, uh, so again, uh, uh, the way I think about this track is uh, frameworks and what can we use or can we leverage. So I think what was most remarkable way, way back in the day was when Microsoft was able to develop a legal framework to go and, make, uh, and t um, uh, claim ownership of attacker assets and then uh, as a, eventually prosecute 
uh, threat actors and so on and so forth. So there was a legal framework that they created that enabled them to pursue these angles. So likewise, I think if there's a gap that we have today that limits our ability to make arrests or to speed up the process, then that will be an area of interest for this group as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge area of interest uh, personally because I've been working on cybercrime for many years. And I'd like, to see, I'd like to not have to retire and still be working on cybercrime, <laughs> right? I mean, it's never going to go away, but I'd like to make it somewhat more painful for, for execution-wise. Okay. Well, for what it's worth, we have two lawyers. I don't know if the second lawyer is here, but we have two lawyers, one over there and, and Evan Wolf somewhere floating around too. So anyway, with that, thank you very much, Randy and Bre Brendan. And um, we will next...